Hi everyone, my name is Laura Hewitson and I'm the Research Director at the Johnson Center. I'd like to thank you all for participating today. This presentation is going to be focusing on biomarkers for autism. First, a little disclaimer before we get started. This presentation is aimed primarily towards parents, but I'm much more accustomed to speaking to scientists. So if I use too much scientific jargon or go too fast over something, I apologize in advance. If there is anything you do not understand or if you have a question, please type them in the control panel and I will try to address these at the end if we have time. We also have a number of professionals joining us today. For those of you who will be attending IMFAR in a few weeks, please join us for an educational symposium on understanding scientific, ethical, and social challenges in autism biomarker research that will be presented by myself and three of my colleagues and will cover many of the same issues discussed today but in greater detail. So in today's presentation, I will begin by offering a definition of a biomarker and providing information on how biomarkers can be used in autism research. I will then describe some of the scientific, ethical, and social challenges that are important considerations in research as we move forward in developing biomarkers for autism. And then finally, the latter part of the presentation will describe some of the autism-specific biomarkers that are currently being developed. Although the term biomarker is relatively new, specifically in the autism field, biomarkers have been used in medicine for considerable time. For example, body temperature is a well-known biomarker for fever. Blood pressure is used to determine the risk of stroke. Cholesterol values are a biomarker and risk indicator for coronary and vascular disease. And C-reactive protein is a marker for inflammation. There are several definitions of biomarker. This one was developed by an NIH-sponsored working group, and it describes a biomarker as a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of some process, and that could be a normal biological process, a disease, a pathogenic process, or a response to a challenge, an intervention, or a treatment. One of the most important considerations when describing a biomarker is the objective nature of biomarkers. Objective meaning reliable and accurate. This is in contrast to clinical measures that are used in medical practice, which while often might be referred to as a marker or a biomarker, they are inherently subjective and they require an evaluator to interpret what's going on. So to break out this definition further, I'm going to highlight a few of the terms used in this definition. First of all, characteristic. This describes anything that can be measured. It could be a physiological response. It could be molecules in tissues or bodily fluids. It could be uh, to measure cells, such as in cancer. And it could relate to body structure. So biomarkers therefore come in many different flavors or varieties and can represent any number of different characteristics. As I've already mentioned, biomarkers must be objectively measured. This cannot be accomplished without many of the new that have been developed over the last decade. And it is these technologies that allow us to objectively measure biomarkers. They include things like structural imaging, molecular biology tools, the various omic technologies like proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, and also functional imaging. It is also important to understand that biomarkers are an indicator of something. For example, what are they evaluating? In medicine, biomarkers can be diagnostic, meaning they can detect the presence, stage, or type of disease. They can be prognostic, which provides information on a clinical outcome in absence of specific treatment. They can be predictive, meaning that they can predict a clinical response to a specific treatment or intervention and they can be pharmacodynamic, which provides information on a response to a specific treatment or intervention. Finally, we can define intervention in a number of ways, not only as drugs used in medicine, but also as medical devices, 
perhaps assistive technology, and even behavioral intervention. The description of a biomarker that I have just provided also applies to the field of autism research. Currently, there are no known clinical biomarkers that can identify autism risk with a high degree of certainty or diagnose autism in the absence of behavioral observations. And while the ultimate goal may be to find a global treatment for autism, in order to prove that an intervention is effective, researchers must first show, among other things, that the biomarker that they are measuring is relevant in a clinical setting. Therefore, biomarkers need to be stable or predictable across and within individuals. They must be re reproducible across multiple laboratories and clinical settings. And they must maintain adequate sensitivity and specificity. There are several potential applications of biomarkers in autism research. These fall into four main categories, ascertaining risk, used for diagnostic purposes, including subgrouping phenotypes. They can be used as predictive biomarkers and also as therapeutic biomarkers or treatments. I shall now go over each of these individually. Firstly, biomarkers can be used to provide a reliable screening tool for infants and children to determine risk. Now, we know autism is the most inheritable of neurodevelopmental disorders. And from twin and family studies, we also know that there are strong genetic contributions in the etiology of autism. But none of the genes or genetic variants that have been identified so far can be considered clinically useful for assessing autism risk with a high degree of certainty. However, it is interesting that these same twin and family studies also imply a strong non-genetic contribution to autism. And this can include things like preconception factors, such as parental age, specifically um, on the side of the father, maternal health history, the use of assisted reproduction, geographic location, and many other preconception factors. There are also prenatal factors that may imply a stronger risk for autism, including maternal health, their diet, prescription drug use, pregnancy complications, environmental exposures in the home or in the workplace, geographic location during pregnancy, and stress, depression, and other health-related complications in the mother. Finally, there are postnatal factors, including low birth weight and failure to thrive. The sex of a child, obviously this is the biggest risk factor since we know that there is a, almost a four to five um, greater risk for a boy to develop autism. Also a history of infections and asthma, colic, allergies, and a variety of other environmental exposures. All of these can have a role in ascertaining risk for autism. Biomarkers may also be useful for improving the reliability of clinical diagnosis. Although autism is defined on the basis of behavioral criteria, the condition is also associated with a wide range of comorbid conditions and other biological phenomena, such as seizures, anxiety, language impairment, and even GI problems. It is hoped that translating markers of these comorbid factors or phenomena into clinically useful biomarkers will improve the validity and efficiency of existing diagnostic methods. While it is highly unlikely that a biomarker will ever replace a behavioral diagnosis, they certainly can be helpful in subgrouping people with autism based on associated comorbid conditions. Biomarkers may also be useful as predictive markers while a child is pre-symptomatic, so before they have any symptoms of an autism phenotype. The behaviors that are characteristic of autism first emerge and then evolve over the first few years of life. In many cases, though, it is difficult to distinguish autism symptoms from normal variations in development or from transient delays that resolve over time. 
It is therefore hoped that valid biomarkers that are identified before the onset of clear symptoms may help us in the early detection of emerging autism. Finally, biomarkers may be useful for identifying novel treatments to confirm the need for a specific treatment in a subgroup of individuals or to monitor treatment efficacy. Research into identifying biomarkers for autism is still in its infancy. This is highlighted in this slide, which represents the number of published studies listed in PubMed that include the terms both biomarker and autism in the title and or abstract from the last five years. There were 96 papers in total, and you can see that the general trend is that the number of papers published is increasing by about 30% per year. This trend also appears to be continuing for 2013 based on the number of new autism biomarker papers that have so far been published this year. However, when you compare this to biomarker studies in other diseases or disorders, you can see that autism is dwarfed not only by cancer, which is to be expected, but also by other neuropsychiatric and neurological disorders. The number of papers published in a field is typically a proxy marker for the amount of funding available and therefore the number of researchers working in that particular field. So it may come as no surprise that funding for autism research, particularly in the field of biomarker development, is lagging far behind many other fields. However, autism, finding an autism biomarker has become of great interest to the autism community in recent years. And there are many funding agencies, university initiatives and programs that are investing a great deal of resources into this area. Putting funding aside, there are a number of other challenges that are also hampering our progress. Perhaps the largest roadblock to the development of biomarkers are the various scientific, ethical and social challenges that are associated with autism. There are many stakeholders that need to be considered when developing biomarkers. Along with the scientific community, families, ethicists, pol ethicists policymakers, healthcare professionals, and perhaps most importantly, people with autism, need to be included in discussions as it is important to remember that some people in the autism community do not even support the need for developing biomarkers for autism diagnostics or treatment. Therefore, meeting the challenge of valid, ethically sound, and clinically useful autism biomarkers will only be achieved through collaborative approaches representing multiple parties willing to engage in open discussions of the complex scientific, social, and ethical issues. This image is modified from Walsh et al. in 2011, and provide, which provides a wonderful description of all of the challenges associated in biomarker research, and I would encourage you to read this if you would like further information. A full uh, reference will be provided at the end of the presentation. Defining a complex multidimensional phenotype for autism is very difficult. Currently, identifying behavior symptoms through standardized assessments, semi-structured play-based interviews, or questionnaires combined with clinical judgment are considered the gold standard for making an autism diagnosis. An inherent limitation of this diagnostic method is that a child must be of a certain age in order to assess the absence or presence of critical diagnostic behaviors. There is also a lack of an agreed and stable definition of autism. In fact, the proposed changes to the DSM-4 criteria, which will be released as DSM-5 in a few weeks, suggest that the precise behavioral definition of autism is still in flux. The clinical phenotype of autism is widely heterogeneous. In fact, the heterogeneity of autism is perhaps the biggest scientific challenge to overcome. As a spectrum disorder, autism encompasses individuals with very different presentations of symptoms. While every individual on the autism spectrum has problems to some degree with social skills, empathy, communication, or behaviors, 
the level at which this impacts their functioning, and the combination of symptoms that each person presents with varies tremendously from person to person. In terms of a diagnostic biomarker, it is highly unlikely that a single biomarker will be represented in all people across the spectrum. Also, variability in diagnoses, IQ, comorbid medical conditions, demographics, also greatly complicate the interpretation of biomarker findings. Developing large biorepositories or expanding our existing ones that are comprised of well-characterized biological samples will therefore be necessary to validate the clinical significance of putative biomarkers. Future biomarker studies require the ready availability of high-quality blood, urine, and tissue samples that have undergone rigorous phenotyping. They should be representative of the autism population, including age, gender, race, diagnoses, and geography. They should include ASD groups and non-ASD groups, with both sibling and non-sibling controls, as well as parents. Also, multiple risk populations should be included, such as children at risk for ADHD, anxiety, and dyslexia, to establish that the biomarker is not present in multiple disorders. This will not be accomplished without engaging the public both to seek their input on biomarker research and to encourage their participation in clinical trials. There are also a number of ethical and social challenges that should be considered as we move forward in developing biomarkers for autism. The heterogeneity of autism contributes to a complex phenotypic picture of autism. People are located somewhere on a broad spectrum from low to high functioning. This is reflected, for example, in the range in IQ, from severe intellectual impairment to extremely high in Q, and also in communication styles, from no speech or language use to highly articulate speech and language. The concept of a spectrum is also used to capture the variability in health, in developmental difficulties, and in sensory problems that contribute to the different profiles of people who are affected by autism. This level of complexity and the broad spectrum of functioning that characterizes the condition may not be fully appreciated. For example, a diagnosis of autism can represent a person who is extremely disabled but who may have some unique strengths, such as art, music, or mathematics, or someone who functions effectively when he or she can work in solitude and engage with colleagues in virtual discussions, but who is profoundly disabled by social difficulties in real-time encounters with them. Furthermore, the position of an individual on the autism spectrum is not fixed throughout their course of their life. So given the relatively plastic nature of autism symptoms, particularly early in life, and the possibility of movement within a broad spectrum throughout the course of life, it is very important that biomarker discovery in autism does not result in children being given a biological label that fixes and defines their potential early on, which may also define their future interventions, treatments, and care. The prospect of autism biomarkers also asks the fundamental question of what value to place on autism as a condition. Autism is generally described in a negative way by listing its core attributes as impairments in social communication, narrow and restricted interests, and stereotype behavior. But emphasis could also be placed on the more positive aspects of the condition, such as strong attention to detail, unusual memory, fascination with systems and patterns, and heightened skills. Forms of giftedness are also found in some in individuals. A debate about whether autism is a disability extends outward from the autism community. On one side of the debate is a group that includes proponents of neurodiversity who claim that autism is best understood as cognitive difference 
and that it requires no treatment or intervention, but rather social acceptance and support. From the neurodiversity perspective, the search for biomarkers designed to identify, treat, or even prevent autism is fundamentally misguided from a moral point of view. On the other side of the debate are those who regard autism as a serious disability unscientific research into the condition with the hope that it will lead to a cure for autism or to a means of preventing autism in the future. Families that are caring for a child that is very significantly impacted by autism would most likely welcome the development of treatments and therapeutic interventions that may improve the quality of life of their child. So as you can see, these two perspectives are polarized on the issue of autism as a disability. However, the issue that probably causes the most concern to some members of the autism community, and indeed to members of the general public, with particular cultural, religious, or personal views on reproductive decision making, are the prospects of prenatal diagnostics leading to large-scale elective termination of fetuses deemed to be at risk for autism. The development of a biomarker that could identify the risk of autism through amniocentesis, which is performed in utero, could lead to elective termination of at-risk pregnancies becoming the norm. Perhaps a family who already has an affected son with autism may choose to undergo pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is where a blastomere or a cell from an eight cell embryo is removed for carrier typing in order to select a female embryo to then transplant into the mother in order to lower the risk of that child having autism. Given the complexity and heterogeneity of autism, it is unlikely that a single biological test or biomarker will be able to establish the risk of autism in an embryo or fetus with a high degree of certainty. But regardless, it is very appropriate and timely to consider the impact of autism biomarkers in relation to reproductive choice. If there is a natural reluctance on the part of many people to bring children with disabilities into the world, which would mean a high likelihood that fetuses identified as at risk will be terminated, then it is imperative that biomarker-based information on the risk of autism, a condition that some argue is not even a disability, is translated into clinical practice with great caution and care. Given the debate about whether autism is best thought of as a disability or just a difference, it is necessary that the clinical utility of biomarkers is established with involvement from people with autism and from their families whose lives will be affected by such decisions. Published scientific agreement about the clinical utility of biomarkers may also help to better inform decision making by parents who receive results of genetic tests for autism. How genetic counselors communicate to parents the probabilistic risk from these types of biomarker tests is likely to have an enormous impact on parental decision making. In the rest of this presentation, I will be providing information on some of the more promising biomarkers that are currently being developed for autism. I think it's fair to say that most of the research into autism biomarkers has either been focused on ascertaining autism risk or for improving diagnosis. However, as we expand our understanding of biomarkers that identify risk factors in autism, we may be able to apply this information to developing predictive biomarkers while a child is genetic. As we develop biomarkers, for autism, but it can also help. There are a number of biomarkers that have been proposed for autism. They are loosely divided into two subclasses, neuromarkers 
and also biological markers. Neuromarkers are associated with changes in brain structure or function, and so they involve some kind of brain measurement or imaging. Biological markers are those which are obtained from biological samples, which typically involve the measurement of gene expression, the level of proteins and metabolites in cells or bodily fluids. Head size is a very interesting measurement that may be associated with autism. Some studies have reported accelerated head growth in children with autism during the first year of life. And brain imaging studies have implicated specific parts of the brain. However, whether head size is a robust biomarker for autism is still a matter of debate, depending on where the study took place and the age of the participants. A recent study out of Norway analyzed data from children born between 1999 and 2007, which included 249 children diagnosed with autism at age 3. All infants had their head measured six times in the first year of life, and that is the standard of health care in, in Norway. The researchers found little difference in head growth between the 200 for boys who were later diagnosed with autism and those who were not. But in the girls who were later diagnosed with autism, they started out with smaller heads and had slower head growth throughout the first year in life than their typically developing peers. In fact, at 12 months of age, the head size of girls in autism was the, an average of 7 millimeters smaller than that of typically developing infants. The researchers also looked at the incidence of macrocephaly, or a larger than normal head, when infants were one year of age. About 12% of boys who were later diagnosed with autism had a head size in the highest 3%, compared with only 3% of the typically developing group. This study is significant both for its size of subjects but also because it analyzed data from the general population. Most previous studies of head size have focused on children recruited through a clinic which are potentially subject to greater bias. However, the number of girls included in the study was low due to the male bias in autism. And a more recent study published a few weeks ago measured head size in twins that were discordant for autism. They found that both children with autism and their unaffected twins had head sizes that were significantly larger than average. So this study supports the idea that a larger head size is an endophenotype for autism, meaning that it may be a biological trait in both individuals within a family, that a child who is affected by autism and an unaffected member of their family. Clearly, further research is needed to determine whether head size and growth is an appropriate biomarker for ascertaining autism risk. The second biomarker study I'm going to highlight used a technique called diffusion tensor imaging with fractional anisotropy, which is basically a souped up type of MRI. DTI can be used to track the development of white matter in the brain. White matter is made up of bundles of millions of nerve cells at nerve fibers that create the wiring through which nerve cells communicate with each other. And it is thought that abnormalities in white matter not only disrupts communication within the brain, but also impairs normal brain development. So in this study, the researchers enrolled six-month-old infants that were at risk for developing autism, meaning they came from families that already had one biological child with autism. Each infant had diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging at six months of age, followed by a behavioral assessment at the age of two. So this is a longitudinal study. They also had follow-up scans at one and two years of age. At age two, 30% of the children scanned met the criteria for autism, while 70% did not. More importantly, the two groups differed in the development of white matter fiber tracts, the pathways that connect the brain. So while these study findings are still preliminary, 
and diffusion tensor imaging is not ready to be used to diagnose autism in infants. This technique will help researchers better understand the changes in white matter tract development and also raises the possibility that we may one day be able to interrupt or alter white matter tract development using targeted intervention. The small sample size and the costly and invasiveness of this as a routine biomarker limit its utility currently. Measuring various aspects of a baby's cry from the earliest days of life may identify risk for neurological problems, including autism, long before behavioral differences can be detected. I include this study because I found it quite interesting in terms of the uh, characteristic being measured, the cry acoustic. It examines ways in which infants at risk for autism produce cries as compared to the cries of low-risk infants. Recordings of babies' cries were excerpted from vocal and video recordings of six-month-old infants at risk for autism spectrum disorder and those with low risk. The infants were considered to be at risk if they had an older sibling with a confirmed autism diagnosis. The cries were categorized as either pain-related or non-pain-related based on observations of the videotapes. At-risk infants produced pain-related cries with higher and more variable fundamental frequency, this is also described as pitch, compared to the low-risk infants. Furthermore, a small number of the at-risk infants were later diagnosed with autism at 36 months of age. The cries for these babies, the ones that went on to develop autism, had among the highest fundamental frequency or pitch values and also differed in other acoustic characteristics. These findings demonstrate the potential of this approach for babies as young as six months of age, but there are concerns about how easily this could be developed into a diagnostic test based on all the variables that would need to be controlled. So in addition to neuromarkers, there are also a number of potential biological markers or targets that have been proposed for autism that are derived from measurements of bodily fluids, primarily blood, but also urine, stool, and saliva. Many of these are listed here, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. However, if we look back at the previous constraints used to describe an autism biomarker, you will remember that um, I commented that a biomarker test needs to maintain adequate sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity meaning that it identifies autism in a high number of cases, a high degree of sensitivity, and specificity meaning that it is only spe specific or unique to autism. However, very few, if any, of the targets listed here are specific to autism when considered alone. They may be useful as an additional screening tool when used in conjunction with other tests or to help shape treatments, but it is unlikely that they could be used alone for ascertaining an autism diagnosis, as many of these, as discrepancies in many of these, are also seen in a number of metabolic conditions. We are in an era of highly innovative molecular technologies in the research laboratory, and these have helped us recognize that autism is a result of multiple systems that have gone awry. So targeting systems rather than single molecules will likely result in more measurable biomarker profiles. So the next few slides describe some of the advances in the omics technology, genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, that may aid in the development of a biomarker profile or fingerprint for autism. Gene expression changes measured in blood may help differentiate children with autism from those without autism. In this study, researchers use microarrays to examine gene expression across tens of thousands of genes in blood samples taken from children younger than 24 months when parents or doctors might suspect that that child has autism, but before a definitive diagnosis can be made. 
they identified 154 genes whose expression strongly differed between the 30 boys and girls that were later diagnosed with autism and 34 developing, typically developing children. Many of these genes belong to the same key pathways such as those involved in learning and memory. Using statistical modeling, the researchers were then able to reduce this list of 154 genes to a panel of 48 genes and then test this panel in a different subset of children with autism and control children. And their panel accurately identified autism with an accuracy of around 87%. However, they did not speak to the issue of specificity. So while this study provides promising data that may lead to the identification of a blood-based biomarker for autism, it is still a long way from being developed as a clinical test. To be clinically useful, a test like this would need to di differentiate autism from other neurodevelopmental disorders. There is increasing evidence that immune dysfunction, such as increased inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and microglial activity in the brain, cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood, affects many children with autism. This study suggests that autism is associated with reductions in the level of cellular adhesion molecules in the blood, where they play a role in immune function. You can look at cell adhesion molecules as though they are the glue that binds cells together in the body. So deficits in adhesion molecules would be expected to compromise cell-to-cell -cell signaling and in the brain may compromise brain development and communication between nerve cells. In this study, researchers measured the level of a number of different adhesion molecules in almost 40 children with autism ages 2 to 4 and 40 controls without an autism diagnosis. The study authors found the levels of two of these adhesion molecules, soluble platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecule 1 and P-selectin, were both reduced compared to controls and may result in altered permeability and signaling at the blood-brain barrier. While further research is needed to determine whether reduced levels of plasma adhesion molecules is a robust marker of autism, these findings raise the possibility of a developing targeted intervention to restore immune function through altering the presentation of cell adhesion molecules in the body. Many diseases are caused by protein alteration, so by studying protein patterns in tissues and body fluids, these alterations can then be mapped to provide information about underlying causes of disease. In this study, researchers performed a detailed protein analysis of blood samples from 28 children with autism compared with 30 control children. Using advanced mass spectroscopy, they succeeded in identifying three peptides whose function is in the immune system, the complement factor C3 protein. There is already a known connection between this protein and autism, which further reinforces these findings. All three of the peaks that they identified had good discrimination ability, meaning specificity, for autism. However, this study is based on blood samples in a small number of children, and it did not include many girls, making it difficult to determine whether this panel of biomarkers may be gender specific. And since we have such a um, skew in the number of children that are diagnosed with autism with many more boys rather than girls, it is very important that we don't develop biomarkers just based on samples and measurements in boys alone, as these may then not correlate to girls with autism. Only six of the children in the autism group were unmedicated also, and that could easily affect proteomic results. But this approach did demonstrate proof of principle for the methodology used and may one day lead to a reliable blood-based diagnostic tool for autism. Autism has previously been linked to meta metabolic abnormalities and gastrointestinal problems such as gut pain and diarrhea. 
In this study, researchers investigated whether 29 children with autism had a different metabolic profile in their urine compared with 34 control children. The authors also included 28 unaffected siblings in this study. Using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, they analyzed urine samples and found that each of the groups being studied had a distinct chemical fingerprint with clear and significant differences between children with autism and unrelated controls. The signature that they found was related to gut bacteria. One of the compounds identified in the urine of autistic children was N-methyl nicotinamide, which has also been implicated in Parkinson's disease. A unique chemical signature that can be identified in the urine of children with autism might form the basis of an early diagnostic test. I, include this, I included this um, paper specifically to highlight the importance of including a sibling control group. The data from this paper provides additional evidence of a genetic component to autism since the metabolic profiles in sibling controls was more similar to those with autism than to the typically developing control group. It is very important that sibling controls are included in biomarker studies so that a biomarker is found to be truly specific to autism rather than being a familial biomarker in a family that is at high risk for children to develop autism. The next step would be to confirm the results in a much larger group of age-matched children as well as following high-risk children from birth in order to identify whether the markers that were identified here precede the development of autistic symptoms. These biological changes may also be of value in monitoring the success of therapeutic interventions. Chromosomal microarray analysis is a genetic test that samples the whole genome by examining chromosomes for tiny submicroscopic deletions or duplications of DNA sequences. They're known as copy number variants. Chromosomal microarray analysis would indicate that, for example, this child in the image has a duplication shown in red on chromosome 15, a region of chromosome 15 which is frequently duplicated in children with autism. The currently recommended tests, which is carrier typing to look for chromosomal abnormalities and for testing fragile X, for example, often come up negative. And in this study, the authors reported that the chromosomal microarray analysis offered about a hundredfold greater resolution than standard carrier typing. So it is much more sensitive than standard diagnostic tests currently in use. And it may be useful in the evaluation or confirmation of autism and other developmental disorders. They also noted, however, that most of the copy number changes were unique or identified in only a small number of patients. So the implications of this research clearly needs further study. While expectant parents who have family members with autism, as well as families who are already have an affected child, often request genetic testing, there is still only limited knowledge about actual causative genes. Since this is a relatively new test, it is often considered a second-tier genetic test. And so depending on where a person lives or what insurance they have, chromosomal microarray analysis may not be covered by health insurance. But I think we can expect to see chromosomal microarray testing becoming part of routine testing both prenatally and for a newly diagnosed child in the near future. As the field of autism biomarker research continues to grow, we really need your help. Please consider participating in a research study, clinicaltrials.gov, the Ian Project, and Autism Clinical Trials Network provide lots of great information on current studies that are currently enrolling children and other family members in which you can participate. Also encourage others to participate in a study. 
if anybody approaches you and asks how they can help, encourage them to look online or provide them with the information so that they can be empowered to help those that are affected by autism. At the Johnson Center, we are also working on developing a blood biomarker for autism for both diagnostic and treatment purposes. And we are currently enrolling children with autism, both boys and girls, their unaffected siblings, and neurotypical controls between the ages of 18 months and 8 years of age. It does require an office visit to our center. However, we are in the process of hopefully expanding this study and maybe offering it to families in other geographic areas. So please contact us through our website or by email below to let us know if you are interested. Thank you so much for listening. That concludes the presentation today. Listed below are all of the articles in which I have cited. I'm going to leave this up for a few minutes while I check to see if any questions have come in and we'll try to address those questions. So uh, it's going to go quiet for a few minutes as I just uh, catch up on those questions and I'll be back in just a moment. Thank you.